Uh, this is Hilary Wilson for the Folklore Podcast. Today we'll be interviewing the acclaimed artist Natalie Frank. Most recently, she provided the electrifying artwork for Princeton University's The Island of Happiness, The Tales of Madame Donois. Welcome to the show, Natalie. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so what was it like to provide the illustrations for this sort of a book? Um, well, it's, you know, it's been quite a journey and a wonderful experience working with Jack Sipes over the past six, seven years. And this is our third book together. And I think of the images I provide as drawings, not as illustrations. Um, that's an important distinction for me. So I'm not aiming when I begin to work um, to capture the stories to illustrate any key scenes, but more to use the drawings as a starting point to um, kind of expand the world off the page a little bit. And I um, tend to go through the stories and read them and find scenes that speak to me in terms of imagery or color. Um, I have really strong synesthesia. And so a lot of um, the experience for reading for me is tied to the images that it produces. And then I think about, you know, what's important for the story. So it's a, it's a balance of those two things when I'm approaching the literature and then um, use that as a, a springboard for the drawings. And I think all of the work we've done together, but, but most pointedly the Madame de Noir stories, I've used them to sort of make feminist representations of what I'm reading. And with Madame Del Noir, it's so clearly on the page already, unlike the Grimm's fairy tales, um, <laughs> or the Sorcerer's Apprentice for that matter. <laughs> it wasn't uh, a far leap. Uh, the first thing that really <laughs> drew me to the book um, was the cover illustration, which is remarkably striking. Um, I I've, well, drawing, I should say. Um, <laughs> I I've never seen anything quite like that. and. You know, I felt like it not only was grasping the themes of transformation that are apparent within the work, but also so much of the ferocity <laughs> that is, you know, in her work. Mm -hmm. um, it was just fascinating to me the way that, you know, you were able to put so much motion within the drawings. Thank you. Should I hold up a copy of the book? So oh, that would be brilliant. Yours could see. Okay, excuse me. No problem. So this is, I have it on my bookshelf, um, the cover. And yeah. the drawing is um, one of the finette syndrome, one of the Cinderella drawings. And <clears throat> it's a kind of charming story because the woman, I use models uh, to pose and I light and dress them for every series, only the women. I never work for male models. Um, so all of the women are fully realized and rendered and the men tend to be more caricature-ish. Um, and so that model is Claire Gilman, who's the curator at the Drawing Center in New York, who um, gave me my first show with the Grimm's fairy tales and my first museum show. And it led to my first book with Jack Sipes, the, um, of the unsanitized 19th century Grimm's tales. So, and she's a strikingly beautiful woman, but I think she, she has what you said, that ferocity in her eyes. And so for me, she was Cinderella and I thought she should transform into um, almost like a lioness. And, you know, Cinderella in the story guides her stepsisters and guides her family towards this kind of ethical um, future, despite deploying violence and killing, <laughs> <laughs> killing the, beheading the ogress and pushing the ogre into the fire, which is a part of, I guess, what women have to do to, um, to um, prosper at times in life. And so uh, she really, captured Claire's, I thought Claire captured her spirit and she captured Claire's spirit. So it was yeah. wonderful to have her on the cover. With the ogre and the ogress, I thought that it was a bit of them starting to defeat the expected life that women might have to live mm -hmm. and instead claiming their own destiny for themselves. Mm 
exactly. And I, I liked that the ogress was the one actually in charge of the ogre was like, you will not be eating them because I will be eating them. Um, and I, I love the female characters in Del Noir's work. So it was, it was a pleasure to, um, to draw them. Yeah, the, um, the one of the other uh, drawings that really stuck out to me that you actually wrote about a bit um, was for the tale of Mira, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with you know Mira kind of <laughs> above everything. Right. I um, was able to talk to Jack Zipes a little bit about that one and just what a an unusual story it was. Um, I really felt the difference between what Donois was doing compared to what the Grimms were doing, mm -hmm. you know, with their tales, mm -hmm. where she was able to employ, you know, a sense of satire, mm -hmm. you know, essentially, you know, particularly with the tale of Mira, mm -hmm. you know, so beautiful that anybody who looked at her would just die from <laughs> that sense of beauty. <laughs> Were there anything that you would like to say about that particular piece? I. It was such an unusual um, story, and it, it was one of my favorites for that reason. Um, and breaking the wall between the narrator and the audience felt so modern, um, postmodern, that um, it was really striking. And I hadn't encountered anything really like that um, in terms of fairy tales. Um, and it was humorous and um, it seemed to almost approach her own work with, as you said, a sense of irony. So on one hand, <clears throat> Del Noir is writing these very 17th century <clears throat> French Baroque tales with lots of jewels and everything is happening with like with the millions, you know, they're like millions of rubies and horses and rainbows and fairies. But then you have this story that goes back to a basic need of beauty, but also hunger. And in the end, she's, the narrator says, I'm done with this, I'm hungry. I'm gonna go get my own food. And it's just, it's a kind of fantastic reminder that these stories which are so ornate can really be taken down to their basic kind of primal human needs. And I really, yeah. I really like that. And I really enjoy just trying to imagine that story being told you know, mm -hmm. in the salon environment and the confusion of the people at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> Just like, yeah, nah, I'm going to go eat, guys. <laughs> um, a friend posed for that who was about seven months pregnant at the time. So it's, it's really fun when I begin the drawings to think about who I know, who I know and what character they should be. Um, but she is the woman who posed as one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. Um, so that was also a fitting casting. And I like the idea of her being pregnant and then the hunger that's present within yeah. the story. Yeah. That definitely. It can only be beautiful so much. I'm really just hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's something that we all can relate to at some points. <laughs> I'm hungry all the time. <laughs> uh, I, you know, reading these, you know, reading these particular fairy tales and thinking about the feminist themes in them was a really interesting experience because she is you know, a writer that as you read her, there doesn't seem to be much of a time between when she was writing and now. Mm -hmm. she, she feels intrinsically modern. Mm -hmm. And one of the stories where that was really um, coming out for me um, was in uh, Belle Belle. Yeah. with the themes of cross-dressing that were present in it. Yeah. it um, and, you know, the drawings that you did for that, I thought were absolutely beautiful. You. Um, you know, particularly the, you know, one of the final images um, with the breast exposed, you know, akin to Joan of Arc. I thought that was just absolutely mm -hmm. stunning. Mm -hmm. And that was probably the tale that resonated the most with me, that and the rather fascinating white cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but Belle Belle, I loved the way that you were showing the you know, relationship between you know, her female side and her male side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, dancing with that shadow self in a very <laughs> kind of Jungian way. Uh -huh. I love that, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, 
what did you make of the ideas, the kind of morals that were present within the stories? Because I thought that, that was a very interesting aspect of them that they weren't exactly the same as the more Christianized uh, morality tales, but there was something that seemed to me um, more feminine almost, but like kind of a lecturing to anyone who might be you know, reading it that like kindness will always be rewarded even if you might not want to reward the person who's there doing you wrong. Right. Um... And I would say, what do you mean by feminine? Do you mean in terms of softness or kindness? Not actually softness or kindness because the idea of rewarding people who had done you wrong, which was present even in the white cat, like mm -hmm. with the white cat, the prince is you know, trying to win the kingdoms and you know, his brothers are very much opposed to him getting it. Like, no, we deserve this. We deserve this. We're going to conspire against you. Mm -hmm. But at the end, he still rewards his brothers with the other kingdoms. Mm -hmm. So instead of the kindness or forgiveness being something that's soft, which mm -hmm. it could be, it's almost a defiant you know, mm -hmm. kind of nature of forgiveness that mm -hmm. there, you will be rewarded for this kindness, even if it's against your actual nature to do so. So mm -hmm. it's a kind of fierce femininity you know, at odds with the idea that being kind is soft. Mm -hmm. It is a kind of Christian morality of, you know, do unto others. Um, <clears throat> I guess what I really appreciate and what I see as feminist, I don't mm -hmm. know feminine, but um, <laughs> feminist in the tales is this idea that you can do right by others, but you can also, um, commit violence and even the score on the road there. <laughs> Certainly. Um, and I, I, that's something that resonates. And I think that, that, in, that embracing of ambiguity does feel very contemporary. And I think that <clears throat> runs parallel to the idea of, you know, a woman cross-dressing to save her kingdom. Um, she's not, you know, in kind of acknowledging that we're not at the point where women can just be women and save the kingdom, they still have to put on men's clothing. Um, so it may not be true, you know, it's not true cross-dressing because she doesn't, in the end, she is a woman and she marries the prince and she still has these um, draws of traditional femininity, mm -hmm. um, which may not be, really resonate today, but this idea of having to perform, I think, to be something other than you are because of societal constraints um, does resonate and something that feels very, you know, post Me Too and, you know, after during this COVID time of COVID with Black Lives Matter and this kind of greater awakening in society um, that marginalized individuals deserve dignity. Um, oh, certainly. That really resonates. And it's yeah. very different from the kind of smirking that goes on in the Grimm's fairy tales, where there might be a bone here or there of feminist aspiration. But I've never read a fairy tale that's this um, old and that feels that contemporary for that reason. Yeah, I also thought that it was uh, particularly you know, interesting, as I said before, that the you know, woman was transformed into the cat, mm -hmm. you know, into this ferocious animal. You know, even though she has this dignity, you know, cats are, they're fearsome. <laughs> they are it's teeth so and claw. Silly. Yeah. Like where, eating dinner in her castle, you know, almost having, you could see her having high tea. Oh, um, yes, with her uh, little yeah. chorus of other cats, and she's playing war yeah. with the rats. And yeah. on the flip side, you know, with the exception of the green serpent, you, you have men transformed into bluebirds or rams mm -hmm. or these, you know, fairly peaceable, um, not so threatening mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, creatures, but it's the woman who is the cat. Yeah. And the, I, I thought it was, um, also just pretty incredible that, 
you know, she had to be killed to, you know, become human again. Mm -hmm. You know, and the drawing that you did depicting that was just amazing. Oh. <laughs> well, there's, it almost felt, and tell me if you felt this way, that she was transformed into a cat almost as a respite from having to be a woman. Um, and that's a powerful idea. I mean, the men who were transformed were cursed, mm -hmm. but in her instance, it felt like she was operating from a position of power. She had all the strings, you know, she was pulling them and she was the one who decided, you know, who it was that she would get to be with. Mm -hmm. You know, she was the one in control of this truly utopian place. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the end, it wasn't the it wasn't the tragic ending of the island of happiness which just was gutting mm -hmm. but instead it was this interesting moment of just you know transformation in a sense i felt a little bit strange about her leaving her kingdom like mm -hmm. what would become of all of that in the end i think there's something in madame de Lenoir that felt like a, re a celebration of all these material things, but a, a really strong recognition that they were temporal. Um, and that, as you said, it's the, it's the way you act, it's the way you treat others, it's love, it's honor, it's those kind of abstract ideas that matter. And so everything else can just go away. Um, but I, I did think there was something, um, it reminded me of, what would come late, like the Master and the Margarita, and I wonder if Bulgakov had read Madame Donois, but this idea of um, intertwining this kind of violence and sexuality and animal human transformation. Um, the fact that he had, she told him that he had to cut off her, part of her body for her to transform, felt like this um, almost that, she was performing the sex act in some way, almost like inviting him to commit this violence against her that was really unsettling and um, gruesome and powerful and like seductive at the same time. Yeah, and I loved the way that you portrayed that um, in you know, those particular drawings. They really stuck with me in my mind, like her leaping from the cat skin is just this incredibly powerful thing and it was you know reminiscent of like um is it Sekhmet the uh, Egyptian cat goddess mm -hmm. who is just the embodiment of like female mm -hmm. violence and sexuality yeah it was really evocative of that to me mm -hmm. and you know that that story in particular just really struck me <laughs> mm -hmm. but I I do find it really interesting you know the you know, kind of undercurrent of violence and sexuality that's present in the stories mm -hmm. and how just like going to the um the eponymous story you know the island of happiness you know how in that one there is a kind of i'm trying to think of the word to use for it but there is a bit of um passivity you know, to the woman in that one that she, you know, lets Adolphus go and she lets him, you know, try to earn his name. Mm -hmm. And then in the end is just empty, you know, mm -hmm. because of course he dies. Mm -hmm. But then as the, as the tales go on, as she continues writing, you know, it's a bit like she just said to hell with that. <laughs> and the women become more and more in control of their own destinies you know, to the point that it is, you know, chop off my head and then you can have me. Yeah, yeah. No, it feels like sometimes she's focusing on the female characters. And sometimes when she focuses on the male characters, it's more to prove a negative point. Like men can't be, um, have honor and, and, and show fealty. And that's the end. And the women are just there to prop up that point. Um, that story a lot there's so much melodrama in her yes. story <laughs> that I feel like she is in many instances like poking fun that that is not it's not meant to like say something about women but it's more to poke fun at maybe the genre of the fairy tale 
or the melodrama of, you know, um, customs of her time. And of course, and I, he's going for the temporary, the material things like my name will go down in history due to these deeds I do. It's like, yeah. well, no, not so much. <laughs> yeah. 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 You'll, go, you'll go down in history, but <laughs> as a failure. <laughs> She's, she was, sounds like, as we say in the South, she was a pistol. Um, <laughs> you know, she, uh, I mean, personally seemed like such an interesting woman in terms of her biography and oh what, yeah what how how little is actually known about you know was she bisexual did she you know was she a spy with her mother was she you know all of these did she actually commit murder which we know she did um so it's uh oh, we talked um to jack zipes a little bit about her biography well a lot about her biography and just the more that comes out the more absolutely bonkers it is <laughs> there there's so much wrapped up in her life that, like you said, that we don't know. And the bits that we do know, you know, the more that we learn, it just gets crazier and crazier. <laughs> and it, I think that, um, you know, the biography that is present within the book now is, it really informs the stories in a very different way. Yeah. It, th there's just this undercurrent of, the vibrancy of her life within them mm -hmm. and it's like no wonder you're writing about you know these terrible men when you helped your friend kill her abusive husband <laughs> you know? or married off at 13 to a no good you know yeah. man you didn't want to marry yeah yeah it's just absolutely wild and you know I think that that's like I'm really glad that's something that we're starting to learn more about um, because, like I said, it just makes the stories that much better. Mm -hmm. It does, absolutely. And um, yeah, I, I I have this show that I'm I'm they're having the opening because of COVID, but it's already open at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art in Wisconsin. Um, that's opened in June. That's a survey show of all my drawing and book work. And <clears throat> so this is the fourth book in that show. The third I've done with Jack. And I've been thinking a lot about what unites, you know, all the bodies of work and the drawings and the stories. And I love that these stories are all, you know, women's oral tales. And that's always, that is what drew me to the four books and stories I've mm -hmm. tackled. Um, Madame Del Noir being the most recent um, and will be the first time it's properly shown. Um, and so, that idea of like using using biography, whether it's in the book or the idea of this idea of fairy tales and women's oral tales being records and documentation of what, what life was like for women at the time they were writing them is a really powerful gesture. And I think it, you know, not only does it enrich the stories, but it, I think it um, illuminates why these women were telling these stories and how they can act as vehicles of actual transformation in life and society and provocation to the point of um, almost like political gestures. And that's what has drawn me to the, the books and the stories that I've looked at. Um, the three books with Jack being the Grimm's, the Sorcerers and Madame de Noir, and then the story of O thrown in in somewhere in the middle, um, the great S&M tale from 1954, French the classic. <laughs> classic. So it's, it's kind of been an interesting journey going back and forth between these fairy tales and then this very, um, this story that was written under a pseudonym, um, almost like a fairy tale that is couched in another story, um, but really does talk about what one woman and women at the time and in the 50s and 60s and has resonated through current time what women want and desire and what freedom looks like for women okay. and that's something that you know all these stories look at i think that sometimes people are just uncomfortable when women start to actually speak for themselves about what they want i can tell you that's the reaction i get most from my work um 
oftentimes people look at isolated drawings and think, oh, what a beautiful blonde. It's a shame she has fangs or, <laughs> um, you know, that kind of sums it up, but it's an uncomfortable, why is it so gruesome? Why is it so hard? Why do you require the viewer to do so much work? And I've never understood why in literature that is not a problem, but in art that seems to be so difficult for people. Um, a, to have to do some work to understand what's going on in the picture. And I don't mean read a book, but um, you know, um, emotional and mental work of processing like difficult things or constructed ideas. And then also these representations of women that are not um, one-sided. It's, it's, uh, it is what it is. I mean, I'm not gonna, you know, I make the work I make, but it's, it's an interesting reaction. No, I think it's fantastic that you're making people do that though. Yeah, you know, I think this is wonderful. If I was in Wisconsin, I would 100% be there to look at them in person. I actually wanted to ask you, you know, when, like where to go to actually, you know, see the work in person, because I think that would be a very powerful experience. I'm really excited. I haven't, we did um, some install over FaceTime. Um, so I'm going to see it for the first time um, this week, actually. Um, but the show was also traveling to the Kemper in Kansas City, Ohio um, in January. And okay. we're hoping it may find a third venue, but. Um, I think that would be absolutely amazing. And yeah. I think that I will probably travel to go see it. Oh, that's so kind. I, I think that would be worth it. I. Yeah, I just think that it's, I think that it's good. I, I think that we need to be exposed to artwork that would make us think like that. You know, I, it, it should make you a little bit uncomfortable. You know, otherwise it's just saying that's a pretty picture and moving on, you know? And commodifying whatever the subject is, um, yeah. which I think is, you know, a big discussion in the art world now in terms of artists of color and, um, it's something that I don't know that Me Too kind of hit some parts of the art world and some amount of representation of women is, um, you know, in galleries and museums and collections, um, but it's, it's, there's a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, there certainly is. Have you seen, you know, in your time doing this art, have you seen any, you know, changes begin to, be, to begin to happen in that regard? Well, I, um, so when I did the story of O drawings and book, mm -hmm. um, an exhibition, it was actually supposed to be a show that a female run gallery was supposed to show. And I had just written a piece in art news about my decade of sexual harassment in the art world. And um, that brought about some real changes um, in terms of um, staffing at certain places. That's good. Which, which was wonderful. And um, so I was supposed to have the show and the female dealer called me up maybe a month and a half before the show. I had done a book independent of her and um, because I thought the context was important and that was sort of, you know, I wasn't, that's why I made the work was to talk about these ideas and I wanted to include a history of the book and, you know, current receptions of the book and an interview. And anyway, she canceled the show, citing that the drawings would trigger women um, who had been sexually harassed or assaulted, um, despite the fact that I had just written this piece about my, yeah. all my experiences and that clearly I've been making feminist work for a decade. And this was the opposite of what I was trying to do. And so I moved the show and um, ended up doing it with Half Gallery here in New York. And New York Magazine did a, a profile on me and the show and, you know, said this is the kind of work we should be doing and talking. These are the things we should be talking about during Me Too. Um, so that was a, a kind of interesting experience and um, encounter, not one I could have really foreseen, but I think the point being that this this comes from men, it comes from women, um, it's built into the structures that, that we've been operating in. And I, I'm hopeful that maybe coming out of COVID and these past two years and everything that's gone on, maybe there will be new structures that continue to um, evolve. 
I'm really um, hoping so. You know, there certainly has been more discussions of it, at least. Like, yeah. more is, it, the discussions are more out there in the open now, yeah. which I think is a very powerful thing. Yeah. And I think, yeah. Ideally, we've all had time to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly have. <laughs> yeah. So, are you working on anything new now? I am. I just started a new project with Jack who I drive crazy, I just drive him crazy. I'm like, what's next, Jack? What are we doing next? Um, so we're starting a book on ETA Hoffman um, mm -hmm. and this will be with Yale University Press and it'll be a big color art book, five of his tales. Of course he did the Sandman and the Nutcracker and the Mouse King. Um, but I wasn't familiar with a lot of his other, other tales like the Golden Pot um, and the fact that he invented the sort of the idea of the doppelganger in literature. And so the book will be highly drawn, um, marginalia on every page. Oh, excellent. About 35 large color drawings. It'll be a big book. So it'll be about the size of my Grimm's about eight by 11. Mm -hmm. And um, Jack will write an introduction and he's doing all new translations of the stories. Well, that will so be absolutely fantastic. I'm really, I, I, so I've started working on that. It'll be a combination of black and white drawings, black and white, and a little bit of color and then full color, which we've not done before, so. Well, I'm very excited to get to see that. <laughs> you, <Yeah>, me too. <laughs> uh. So I'm working on that. And then there's um, a really interesting show at the Fort Worth Modern next spring of women painting women. Oh. Um, that Andrea Carnes is doing that'll be a big show at the museum. And so I'm making an oil painting for that that will sit atop a um, mural that I've designed with Flavor Paper, the wallpaper company. Oh, that's cool. Made out of my drawings. And I've been working with them the past couple of years. I did a, a wallpaper for their Femme Power series for my Story of O um, show that's now sold with flavor paper um, commercially. And this idea, I think as I've moved more into performance as well, I, I worked on a ballet from the made out of the Grimm's Fairy Tales, the book that Jack and I did a couple of years ago and um, just finished a small opera project for PBS. Um, as I've moved off the page and, and become a lot more interested in performance and environmental um, kind of how I can use drawing to create these environments, um, the, this idea of, you know, working to, to create these almost backdrops out of drawings has become really compelling. Well, so that that's, sounds excellent. That's coming up. And then in the fall, there'll be a show of my paper paintings of women and animals um, at the Brattleboro Museum um, in Vermont. And then um, Yale University has a show up now of women alumni um, who are in the collection. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'll be, I'll have some of my Grimm's fairy tales in that, in that exhibition. Well, that's a lot to look forward to. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to start going places in person and seeing people again and seeing art yeah. in real life. It's, it's definitely better getting to see things in real life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Getting to get out there again. Yeah, yeah it's true. Oh, well, thank you so much for your time. It was really thank a pleasure you. to get to talk to you. It was. Thank you so much. I really admire all the work you're doing um, thank within you. fairy tales and outside of fairy tales. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <And> <laughs> take care <laughs>